So we'll move on now to uh, my colleague, uh, Mark Dewhurst, who will be talking about MR spectroscopy. Thank you. Um, I'm very impressed with everyone who's shown up for this meeting, and I also thank the organizers, of which I was one of them, uh, for inviting me to this. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm going to talk about MR imaging and spectroscopy, actually, and studying tumor physiology. And uh, this has been a, a long-term uh, effort uh, that uh, spans uh, NC State, Duke, and Colorado State. Um, I was just looking over, I did a little midline search on myself, and, uh, and I was uh, really dumbfounded to realize that we had published, since we started doing these studies back in the 1980s, early 1980s, that we published 75 papers involving uh, canine tumors since 1980. For some reason, it's, there we go. Um, I started uh, my first uh, job at the University of Arizona, and I was recruited there to uh, participate in a program project grant that was run by Gene Gerner. And uh, back in those days, they had site visits for program project grants. And so this was a cartoon that I actually had commissioned for Gene to present to the site visit team to talk about the different projects that were uh, going to be ongoing in this program project grant. The program project grant had to do with using heat to treat cancer. So we have this guy over here who's going to try to heat the tumor. And then uh, this was a guy, this was the clinical uh, side, so they'd run in some clinical trials. Uh, there was somebody who was interested in uh, DNA damage repair, and somebody who's interested in cell membranes, and, uh, and somebody else who's looking at signaling. And here's me over here, kind of wandering around on the outside, thinking about stroma and microenvironment. And, um, and so we'll come back to this uh, slide at the end. Um, when I went to Duke, we, well, we had done a lot of hyperthermia trials at Arizona, and what we realized at that time, and then being recruited to Duke, was that we didn't really understand the temperature distribution in these tumors very well. And it was really hard to tell someone how to measure temperatures in a tumor because we really didn't know where to, where to look. And this, act, this particular paper here was actually key because we took a dog that had a soft tissue sarcoma in the hip and did a CT scan of that dog and then uh, we worked with an engineer who did heat transfer modeling. And he actually modeled the power deposition into this tumor uh, using what's called, called finite element modeling, where we had some invasive temperature measurements. But basically, what he was trying to do was to model the temperature distribution from those few measured temperatures. Um, this particular model, which was done, uh, as you can see, a long time ago, uh, was done in a, just a 2D, one, one 2D slice through the center of the tumor took three days on a Cray computer to complete. Now, we fast forward to, uh, oh, I'm sorry. These are the temperature distributions that he was able to calculate. And these end up being important, as I'll mention in a minute, uh, uh, in terms of understanding what these temperature distributions look like. OK. So we can fast forward about 10 years. And this is another model done in a dog with a sarcoma of the hind limb. And now we're able to do uh, perfusion permeability maps with MRI, that's what that is, and able to include that into the model and figure out what the temperature map looks like. And all of this can be done on a desktop computer in about a day. So we go from a Cray computer in three days in 2D to th full 3D modeling. Uh, uh, that just has to do with power computing. But what's important about this is that we began to understand the distribution of what these temperature or the, what the shape of them look like. And based on that, actually, I was uh, asked to chair an RTOG uh, workshop to establish thermometry standards for hyperthermia. And the result of that was, uh, was this paper here. But there were other papers that came out of this. And so immediately, the canine model made a big impact. It had a huge impact on the conduct of human clinical trials going there forward from that point in time. Now, I want to go on to, uh, to a separate subject, and that is um, that all, virtually all the studies we, re we did were done in soft tissue sarcomas, and we had parallel trials going in humans and in, in dogs uh, at that time. And we know that for high-grade tumors, about half of those patients will go on to develop distant metastases, but right now we don't have a very good way of knowing uh, who in a group of patients with high-grade tumors is going to metastasize and who won't. 
So that's going to be kind of my mantra going forward here. And what we did was to use MR to try to study this. And we had some a priori hypotheses uh, about this that, we, that I will talk about as I go along. But we had some parameters that we thought might be useful in this setting. And these are the things that we found, and I'll go through them, but we found some physiologic parameters that had to do with measurement of lactate and extracellular pH, perfusion, and then some metabolic parameters, including phosphomonoester, phosphodiester levels, which you can measure with P31 MRS, which relate to lipid turnover rate, lipid turnover rate. So it's related to cell proliferation, perhaps, in an indirect way, and possibly even uh, EMT as well. So this just has to do with the biomarker issue. Okay, so um, this is an example of a, MR, a P31 MR spectrum in a soft tissue sarcoma of a dog. What do you get out of this? This is what you get. You get, you get the ATP peaks here. You get the phosphocreatine peak, phosphodiester, inorganic phosphorus, and PME, phosphomonoester. So if you're, if you're really lucky and you have good signal to noise, you can get a spectrum that looks like that. And the other thing you can pull out of this is also the pH of the cell which has to do with the chemical shift uh, between some of these resonances. So you can measure intracellular pH, and you can measure these uh, different parameters, and you can look at their levels by looking at area under the curve of these different peaks. So um, we ran a clinical trial in canine sarcomas. It was a randomized phase two, where we're looking at two different kind of thermal doses in combination with radiotherapy. And it was a, a fairly large uh, trial, 122 dogs. But we had 40 of these that had MRI and MRS studies performed. And that's what I, those are the patients I'm going to talk to you about now. And again, just to give you the bottom line, these are the things that were prognostically important for predicting outcome in terms of metastasis-free survival. Tumor grade and volume, of course, that we know that. We know that's true in humans as well that these are important prognostically. But we found phosphodiester ATP ratio to be significant and also extracellular pH. Not intracellular, but extracellular pH, which we actually measured with electrodes in the tumor. It's an example, actually, because um, the pH electrodes that we were using were needle electrodes that have glass in them. Uh, the IRB would not allow us to do these measurements in humans, but we were able to do them in dogs. It turned out to be extremely important. So here's the pH data, extracellular pH. If the extracellular pH is over 7, there's a, a longer progression pre survival compared to pH less than 7. Intracellular pH was not associated with outcome. And uh, that's because intracellular pH is highly buffered. It's not, it's not uh, so prone to being acidic uh, like you see in extracellular pH. And this is, this is an important paper because this is a paper Deb Prescott published with our group. And basically, what we did here was to measure extracellular pH and intracellular pH. And it had been reported in rodent tumors that there was this differential, that intracellular pH was higher than extracellular. But it had never been shown in a, in a spontaneous tumor. So this is the first time that was ever done. And you can see this is a line of identity here. So in fact, the intracellular pH tends to be higher than extracellular. Gets back to the beta-hydroxychloroquine study that was talked about earlier. But this acidity, that's the extracellular acidity, is what allows that drug to be taken up by tumor cells. OK, uh, I also mentioned that we were interested in phosphodiester, phosphomonoester. This is looking at that ratio. Um, and again, this is the, the ratio. If it's high, then they have a, a greater progression-free survival in it compared to uh, being relatively low. So this has to do with membrane. Uh, turnover, perhaps. Now, we had a parallel trial going on in humans, and we were doing MR spectroscopy in those as well. And here we found that PME to PDE ratio also predicts for metastasis three survival. So two different species, same kind of study, showing the same kind of an effect. You could say, well, either one of these studies is probably underpowered to show the true value of this. But when you see the same effect in two different trials, two different species, it starts to end, lend some credence to the fact that maybe this is important. Now, we also measured uh, perfusion in these uh, canine patients. And I have to say at the outset that we were unable to do the 
uh, traditional Tofts Kermode model because we didn't have arterial input function for these animals. In humans, you could kind of use a standard one, but dogs have such varying sizes and things, it's really not possible. And a lot of times, we didn't have a large enough vessel in field of view to do that. So what we did in, in, instead of that was to do some curve fitting. We looked at the, at the um, AUC max, which would be up here. We looked at the washout rate and the AUC under these different parts of these, parts of these curves. So um, th this is an example of a, of a sarcoma in a, patient, in a canine patient. This is the wash-in parameter, uh, which you notice is highly heterogeneous. And gets to the question I ask, or the comment I made after the last set of talks, and that is, if the drug doesn't get here and there's viable tumor cells in there, it won't matter. If you can't get the drug to the target, it won't matter. So this is the kind of imaging I'm talking about that could be useful for prediction of chemotherapy outcome. But then we're looking at washout rate here and then also the AUCT max. So this particular one is the washout, and you can see a, a huge difference, again, in time to metastasis-free survival, uh, depending on what that parameter looks like. It's either greater than four or less than four. And uh, we also were able to show that the AUCT max was related, related to time to local failure. I think that's less important here because I really wanted to focus on metastasis mainly. Uh, we did look at some human studies, human patients. We didn't have very many. We had about 11 of them. It really uh, wasn't enough to publish, but we saw similar results, at least qualitatively. Um, then at the end, we, we were running a, a separate clinical trial, and in this trial, we did diffusion-weighted imaging to look at pathophysiologic response to thermal radiotherapy. Uh, Diffusion-weighted imaging, which is sometimes called uh, ADC, or apparent diffusion coefficient of water, measures the mobility of water in the tissue. Uh, and since water is polar, you can, you can polarize it with MR and then look at how it moves. And so this is the apparent, apparent what's called apparent diffusion coefficient of water here. And this is prior to treatment. This is a, a sarcoma in the paw of a patient, a, a canine patient. And this is uh, after treatment, and you can see that it's much higher a diffusion coefficient compared to this. So you see a change in diffusion coefficient uh, in response to treatment. This is just the T2 image showing how much the tumor shrank during that period of time. Um, we did serial biopsies on these same patients. We did them prior to treatment, and we did them 24 hours after the first heat, first heat treatment. And I'm, what I'm going to show you is, a very, to me, a very remarkable analysis. And that was we worked with Ashley Chi in the Human Genome Institute at Duke um, to do some genomics on these patients. Now, the first thing I want to point out is if you look at the ADC values, they go, some of the dogs, they went down. Some of them, they didn't change too much. And some of them went up. So it's highly heterogeneous response. All of these patients receiving the same therapy, but highly heterogeneous response in terms of the uh, uh, ADC values. And it turns out these ADC values correlated with the volume change. So. Uh, animals that had a, a, a drop in ADC had uh, smaller tumors at the end of treatment compared to these over here, which actually grew. Now, we did the, anal the genomic analysis, and the first thing that, uh, that Ashley did was an unsupervised analysis, and what he found when he did that was two clusters of data here, this blue one and the red one. And we immediately thought, well, maybe this, these clusters might be related to the ADC changes in ADC, and it turns out they were. So this is group one here, the red ones, and group two. So in fact, if we back up a second here, this is group two, group one. OK? Now, we look to see what was associated with this change in ADC. And what we found were genes that are related to inflammation and tissue remodeling. So. The tumors that showed an inflammatory response and an in, a kind of a tissue remodeling response in, within 24 hours after treatment predicted for outcome five weeks later. OK? 24 hours, five weeks later. Now, uh, we started to look at this a little more depth. We found that, in fact, the uh, receptors for VEGF, that's FLT1 and KDR, were related to the change in the ADC. That makes sense, because these are both related to vascular permeability. 
And so you would expect that if those go up, that the volume change would uh, become larger, that they become bigger. And so that was consistent with what we found. And so part of the end, part of the change in ADC may have to do with hyperpermeability. And just to throw in a couple other things, we found TERT to be positively related to this. And this is the change. This is the change in TERT, by the way, not the baseline expression. And this is a change in RAD23, which is a DNA damage repair protein. And we saw the same kind of thing with BRCA1 in this uh, study. OK, so let me just uh, end up with a couple points here. And that is um, uh, this. And, that, and it was, I, this is what kind of blew me away when I was looking at this data and realizing we published all this stuff in different papers. And then you put it all together, it really makes kind of a cool story. Um, so we did a lot of measurements pre-treatment and, and post-treatment. And of course, I already mentioned graded tumor volume. Perfusion measured prior to treatment predicts for uh, local tumor control. And it also predicts uh, for metastasis-free survival. Uh, PHE I already mentioned, and thermal dose, which I'm not talking about today. Um, and then these parameters also predicted for metastasis-free and overall survival. And on this side, reoxygenation, which I'm not talking about today because it's not imaging, but we did do that, was also correlated with local tumor control and the gene expression things I just mentioned. And then this realkalinization, that's the pH, is starting out being acidic. And then if it, if it goes back toward the more alkaline side after treatment, also predicted uh, for metastasis-free and overall survival. And then, of course, failure to achieve local tumor control can also contribute to this. Now, the point is that things with the little stars by them, we have, we have data in dogs and confirmatory data in people. So again, it gets this idea that you can use these parallel studies in both people and dogs to address questions that maybe are difficult in either species alone. So um, the image data were key, was key for thermal modeling and establishing principles for clinical trial quality assurance. I think these kinds of things can also be done for other types of studies that don't involve hyperthermia, which obviously isn't very popular in this country now. But, but I think this idea that you can use this kind of thing to think about drug delivery and those kind of things could be very interesting uh, using my imaging. Obtaining functional imaging data in the context of therapeutic trials was used to guide and augment results from parallel human trials. Very powerful combination. And the combination of functional imaging and genomics re revealed some prognostically important information and identified some therapeutic targets, which I, which I didn't talk about, but we actually in that paper found some that were interesting um, to, to think about going in the future with hyperthermia trials. So we get back to this, and I realized, you know, you, I did something stupid like this in 1980. I realized I spent the rest of my career f trying to figure it out. Um, and, it, and, and, it, and it turns out. So we have this guy here. Now we know P PME to PDE is important. We know thermal dose is important. I didn't show you that. Um, when we talk about the inflammatory response in a tissue remodeling response, it's heavily driven by HIF-1. I didn't uh, get into that, but the HIF-1 turns out to be important. The hypoxia inducible factor 1, which is transcription factor that re uh, drives the hypoxia response and also inflammatory response. Now we have all these parameters which we measured. Now I've got something to look at out here. It's all this microenvironmental stuff. OK, it all wraps around. OK, um, and the DNA damage response as well. OK, so um, I'll just end up with a few acknowledgments as I've been doing this for a long time. And uh, all the people in green are veterinarians that I worked with over the years. I think I got them all down. I may have forgotten one. I got Mary Kay up there. A few other people. Um, these are the, the uh, MR people that we worked with over the years with the MR data that I showed you, and uh, physicists in our department. And then uh, these are the clinicians and uh, several other uh, people that we worked with over the years. So with that, I'll, be, I'll stop. And uh, I guess we'll move over and sit at the table. Thank you.